What is up you guys? Welcome to the video. My name is Armand. If you're new to this channel, I'm a deep and progressive house DJ and producer based out of Toronto, Canada. And this YouTube channel is aimed at beginner and intermediate level DJs. And it's full of video lessons and tutorials, both on the business side of DJing in terms of getting gigs and promoting yourself and the actual technical mixing side of things to turn you into a better DJ. So if you haven't hit that subscribe button already, please do so to keep up to date with all my tutorials and lessons. All right, so this video, as promised, is the answers to the Ask Me Anything video that I posted last week. And I've got to say thank you so much for all the responses and all the questions. I think there was over 50 questions that popped up after a few days. And I'm really having fun interacting with you guys on the channel. And so I've picked the top uh, eight questions. And as I promised to do, I've divided that into the business side of DJing and also some technical mixing questions. But I will try to answer all of the other questions in the comments in the Ask Me Anything video, which I'll post in the link. I'll post the link in the description below or one of those little YouTube pop-ups uh, up there or down there. So just check that video if you didn't get your question answered in this actual video and check in the comments. All right, so let's jump right into it, starting with the business of DJing types of questions. Jamie says he's a mobile DJ for weddings and corporate events, but he really wants to get into the club scene, such as Coda or Vertigo, both Toronto-based clubs, and he wants to know how did I get to where I am without producing any music? Did it require a lot of networking? Well, yes, yes it did require a lot of networking, Jamie. Uh, that's probably one of the most important things. Um, I see a lot of DJs in the Toronto scene who do get to play good clubs like Vertigo or Coda, and they don't actually produce music, and they don't even put out a regular mix series like a podcast. So, you know, that only leaves one thing left, that they go out a lot, they, pr they promote themselves by word of mouth, and they meet the promoters that book parties in these nightclubs. And remember, sometimes you don't even need to know the managers or the owners of these nightclubs to get a gig there. All you've got to do is actually get in tight with the promoters who book the parties or who uh, put on their events in these clubs. So one way to do it is to start hanging out at the clubs you want to play at, Meet people, right? Don't be too aggressive and just try and ask, you know, book me, book me, please. Can you book me all the time? Really get to know these people, become friends with them, uh, talk up, chat up the other DJs who play there and ask who's booking them, right? Find out which promoters are booking the most DJs at these clubs. And then the other thing, of course, is to promote yourself. So I do recommend uh, going on social media, coming out with at least an Instagram channel and a Facebook artist page then have a SoundCloud page or a MixCloud page, somewhere where you can post your promotional sets, your demo mixes, if you will. And if you have the time, do come out with a podcast, right? I, I do a podcast. I used to do it uh, every other week. I would post a 90-minute mix. I've been a little too busy lately, so I'm doing it more like once a month or once every three weeks, but I'm trying to get back to it. But the idea is to push out regular content, and then you can go promote yourself on Facebook, you know, find the groups that are large, like there's Deep House Toronto, there's Toronto Rave Community that's got over, I think, 50 or 70,000 members. You can post your sets there, you can ask people for feedback, and you want, what you want to do there is build up a bit of an online presence, right? So you've got to do some work with branding and social media, but yes, you also have to be willing to put in the time and the legwork to go out to these parties, go to the clubs, support those clubs, support the artists who are playing there, and eventually the bookings will come. All right, question number two is kind of related to question number one. Mark Listener asks, as a beginner DJ wanting to get gigs and experience, is there any one thing that you found instrumental in helping you break through that barrier to gain momentum and start playing out regularly? Well, yes, in my case, I think I got a little bit lucky. I was fortunate enough to pick up a residency at a large after hours nightclub called Comfort Zone, and I got to play there every week for two years. As a result of playing there, a few people got to know me and got to know my music and my sound. And I also met people while playing there who eventually uh, turned out to be promoters and they booked me to play in other parties or clubs. Uh, so if you can get a residency, that's a major, major advantage. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on in other cities, but in, but in Toronto, it seems that not that many nightclubs have regular residents who play every week. Uh, there's certainly some who book their regular house DJ to play once a month, like Coda has a, a fellow named Scott named Odio. Uh, he's a techno DJ. Uh, Parlor has a couple of uh, regulars who play there, um, not on any regular schedule, but I think they would agree that they could call them uh, resident DJs. But if you can pick up a residency, certainly you should uh, get after that as, as fast as possible and agree to do it if anyone ever offers you a residency. 
Um, and other than that, like pretending I didn't have that residency, which as I say for me was really, really useful. I think the other thing uh, is doing a regular mix series or doing some kind of unique element on social media, such as this YouTube channel in my case, to really try and steer extra traffic to your Facebook artist page and your Instagram page or your SoundCloud where people can hear your mixes. So building up a robust online social presence and trying to do cross promotion between these different social channels. For example, I try and divert YouTube traffic from here because this is my most popular social media channel. I try and divert people from here to my SoundCloud page so that they can actually listen to my sets as well. So um, online branding is huge right now and that's something that anybody can do. So if you can't pick up a residency, try and do something else unique like a, a video series or a vlog series, a vlog I should say, or at least a podcast mix that you do once a month, something like that. All right, question number three comes from Gasp Gaming. Excellent and simple question. How do you get ready for gigs? Typically I'll get ready for my gigs by collecting the music I wanna play first and I'll often look for new music uh, before an important gig and try and have a fresh, you know, uh, arrangement of music to choose from and I'll put about maybe 20 to 30 songs depending on the set time into a folder and I'll start rehearsing by just playing that music and I'll probably practice mixing that music two maybe three times for an important gig. Um, and I'm not coming up with a preset playlist but I am getting used to playing those songs you know, feeling out the energy levels of those songs. And if I do note two that mix exceptionally well together, I will make a note of that in case I want to repeat that when I'm playing the live set. Uh, but basically there's no excuse for practicing and listening to your music to get to know the music. If you're pressed for time and you can't practice mixing at home a whole bunch, what you can do then is throw those, that music onto your uh, cell phone or your iPod and listen to that music when you're out and about, say you're commuting to work or you're driving in the car, just listen to those songs and you can get to know the music and you'll start to get some ideas in your head about which tracks are gonna mix well with one another and you might also notice anything important that could cause you a problem when mixing such as, you know, there's vocals near the very beginning or end of a song and you don't want vocals over vocals and have a problem when you're mixing live. So basically practice mixing the music, you know, take note of any uh, big no-nos with the music or exceptional mixes that you would like to repeat again and just uh, get familiar with that music and practice and that really calms, calms the nerves. All right, so a few questions in there and let's try and break it down a little. Um, as I said in the answer to the last question, I don't use a pre-arranged uh, set list when I play out live, uh, although I will have a folder of music that I know I generally want to play from. But you know, if I'm not finding a song in that same folder that follows well from the song that's currently playing, I will go back into older folders that I've uh, played at other gigs or that I've practiced at home um, so that I can find a song that's you know, in the right key or has the right energy level. So I'm, I'm not tying myself only to that one folder. I will bounce around sometimes if necessary. And that's the importance of knowing your music collection as well. So uh, the other part of the question was, uh, if I do a you know, bad mix, will I repeat it and try it again? If I'm at home practicing, absolutely, absolutely. If I do a mix and it doesn't come out well, but I think that those two songs can and should mix well together, I'll try it again, no problem at all. And find out where the proper point is to start mixing the new song in if there's a timing problem. So for example, if one song had some lyrics that sounded a little bit out of key, when the new melodies in the new song came in, then I might space that mix out a little bit and start mixing the new song in a little bit later so that I can avoid having a melodic uh, overlap where there's gonna be a problem. So certainly I'll, I'll repeat my mixes if I think I need to practice them. Uh, beyond that, my other system for practicing is simply to mix and have fun. Um, you know, I've been DJing long enough that I don't really need to uh, focus too much on the technical nature of beat matching, for example. I can, I can usually uh, keep my beat matching pretty much in check as I'm playing. So I'm really focusing on trying to pick songs that follow well from the song that's currently playing and building the set and the energy level in the direction that I'd like to take it. So, you know, you can uh, see my video uh, that I made a few months back too about how to build a set and how to organize your music into different folders for the different energy levels and that might help you too with planning out your sets and when you practice you can work on the technical stuff but you should also try to maintain some uh, idea or concept of how you want your mix to sound. 
And that leads us very nicely into the next question. Uh, excellent question from Johan, who asks about DJ sets and storytelling. He asks, how do you build a DJ set? How can you have a story built into your set? How can you tell a story with the music? All right, uh, thank you for that question. It's a really excellent one, and it's a difficult and I think kind of nebulous concept about this concept of telling a story with the music. So some people may have heard that Hernan Catanio, uh, Argentinian DJ, is an amazing uh, storyteller. People always say his sets really tell a story. Well, what does that mean? I think that means that the music and the set takes you on a bit of a roller coaster of energy levels and emotions through the set. So one thing with this concept is I think you've really got to have a fair amount of time to be able to do this effectively. And I think I'm, I'm going to say probably three hours. You need maybe two and a half to three hours minimum to be able to really tell a story and have those high points and low points in your set. If you're playing an hour and a half or even maybe two hours, there's not too much you can do with that. When I have hour and a half set times, I try and focus a little bit more on either a linear build of energy, depending where the set is in the night, especially if it's an opening set, or I'll try and have a kind of homogenous sound where the set has cohesion, cohesion and most of the songs have, you know, uh, yes, slightly varying energy levels, but they kind of have a generally identifiable uh, core theme that you can say, okay, that set had you know this type of sound. So when you have a longer set though, it gives you the chance to play with speed and with energy and with the types of percussion, percussion in the song. So just because a song is fast doesn't necessarily uh, mean that's gonna have a very busy layered sound. Sometimes tracks that are only 120 beats per minute, if they have a lot of uh, hi-hats and a lot of extra you know, highs in terms of 16th notes that are very quick, you know, like tuka 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 tuka, you can have a really driving uh, beat that sounds kind of complicated and pushes the music forward, even though the song is only 120 beats per minute. So when you're thinking about building a story with your, mu with your music, I think you have to think about what kind of beats do you want to underlie the melodies and how much vocals do you want to use? And do you want the songs to be more of a darker, mysterious sound or do you want them to be a bit more kind of wholesome and full, like tracks that are in a major key? So if you're telling, trying to do storytelling with your music, I think you definitely have to incorporate concepts of key, uh, speed, complexity of the beats, and harmonies, if I can put it that way, and also vocals, because you know having vocals in a track can really um, do something to uplift the listener. So you have to decide um, on the peaks and valleys and where you want them to be, and how are you gonna use these different elements like key, uh, the beat, speed, and vocals and harmonies to create those swells in your set. So, you know, one kind of more common example is that DJs who play into the, into the night with longer hours, if they're getting past, you know, 2 a.m. and it comes to 3 a.m. and 3.30 and 4 a.m., the music tends to get darker. This is especially the case in heavier techno sets where you really play the dark, weird, kind of sinister, you know, I kind of joke about it, I call it that weird 3 a.m. music, right? Um, so you have to think about uh, where the crowd is in their night and try and you know, do something with the set that will appeal to them. And I know it's a very nebulous concept, but I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into helping you build a story into your set and telling a story with the music.